Yeah. And we're missing Ben here, so. Um, you guys ready? Yeah. Rabbi Yossi open. And this is the Torah that Moshe set before the children of, of Israel. So that is not in this week's Parsha. That's in a different Parsha. It's in Devarim. Um, I think the quote there is in Devarim 4, verse 44. So come and see. The words of Torah are holy, sublime, and sweet, as has been said. For it is written, more desirable than gold, than abundant pure gold, sweeter than honey, which is in Psalms for uh, chapter 19, verse 11. Whoever engages in Torah is as if he stands every day at Mount Sinai, receiving the Torah as is written. This day you have become a people to the Lord your God, also in Deuteronomy. This has already been established by the companions. And this is a very kind of classic introduction where almost every Torah reading begins with the praise of the Torah and the mysteries of the Torah. It is written here, Vizot, and this is the Torah. And the, and the emphasis, the, right, the, we call the Torah reading Parshat Chukat because of the red heifer that's, that's called the Chukata Torah, it's called the, um, the headquarters for the statute of the Torah. And the rabbis go on to define that statute means um, a law that we don't, we don't necessarily understand. We could talk about that later. But here, the Zohar is not really focused, doesn't really care so much about the Chukah, at least not yet. And it's more focused on the word vizot uh, and this. Um, and as we'll see, zot is a stand in for malchut or shechina, the divine feminine. And the vav is going to be a stand in for uh, either yisod or tiferet, the, the six emotional spirit that enter into union with the divine feminine, with the shechina. This is the statute of the Torah. What is the difference between... No, I'm sorry, I skipped a very important few words. And it is written, Zot, other place it's written, this is the statute of the Torah, not with, without the Vav. What's the difference between one and the other? Well, it's a sublime mystery, and we have learned as follows. The Zot, with the Vav, and this is the Torah, that is to display all in single union, merging assembly of Israel, that's the Shekhinah, we are the Shekhinah, we're the, we're, we are the place, so to speak, we are the home, through our community, through our Mishkan, through our Beit HaKnesset, we are the place where God's presence, which is what the Holy One, blessed be He, with the Holy One, blessed be so that all is one. Thus, vizot and this is the Torah with the addition of the vav and question mark. Well, this has been said to show that all is one and is all and all is inseparable. Um, Zeb, go ahead and read the notes. Uh, the first note on. <clears throat> more desirable than gold. The psalmist is praising the commandments of the Torah. On the Midrashic reading of this verse in Deuteronomy 27, see Talmud Brachas, where it says, Rabbi Yehuda opened further in honor of Torah expounding. Be silent and listen, Israel. This day you have become a people to Hashem your God. Now, was it on that day that the Torah was given to Israel? Was it not, was not that day the end of the 40 years of wandering? However, this teaches you that the Torah uh, is as beloved on the day it, when it was given for Mount Sinai. And then the second note on the Zot HaTorah, 
that this is the Torah, and this is the Torah. Yeah. Rabbi Yossi explores the difference between this verse quoted more fully at the beginning of the preceding paragraph and the second verse of Parsha's Chukas, which reads Vezot. This is the statute of the Torah. The wording Vezot and this is the Torah alludes to the union of Shechina or the assembly of Israel known as Zot, this, and Tiferet, who symbolized by written Torah. Furthermore, the prefix V and indicates Tiferet together with the five spheres surrounding him from Chesed to Yesod, since the letter Vav is numerically equivalent to six. So that the single word Vizot and this alludes the inseparable union of Tiferes and Shechina. On Shechina as Zos, Zot, see uh, 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 pre preceding notes, the full verse in Numbers reads, this is the statute of the teaching or of the Torah, that Hashem has commanded, saying, speak to the children of Israel, uh, that they take you a perfect red cow that has no blemish on which no yoke has been put. This red cow or red heifer was to be slaughtered, then its ashes were mixed with water, forming waters of lustration, which were sprinkled upon anyone who had become defiled by contact with a human corpse. Okay, great. So now we're on page 188. Vizot and this, general and particular as one, male and female. Thus, vizot. Um, you know, often in, in the Talmud, the way it will, will uh, read a verse or even a, a certain words is to try to see whether it's a generalization or a specification or, partic or, or a, a particular. Which, which has um, exegesis um, methodology of, of, of arriving at how to understand what the verse is talking about. So, for example, we're, uh, in, it, we're, we're learning in the Dafiomi about Yuma. So if the Torah says, you know, you, could, you, can, you can, a certain type of offering has to be brought at a certain time. So by the very words, it'll tell you how how general or how particular that verse means. So here, the Zohar is playfully using those terms uh, to talk about different spiritual energies, not halachic uh, or, or, you know, specifications and so on. One male, one female. Thus, Vizot... And this is the Torah, surely. In other words, it's a whole relationship of what is Torah. Torah is the written Torah, which is like the masculine. It's the spoken Torah, the oral Torah, which is the feminine. Torah is the, the Torah of Moses, which is Tiferet again. And, 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 and then it's the Torah of the land of Israel through Joshua, which is Malchut, Shechina. So it's the whole, it's the, it's the general, it's the particular, it's the male, it's the female. But now what about when you have no vav, when it just says zot, like it does in this same section of the Torah? This, without the additional vav, is the statue of the Torah. Surely, and not the Torah, rather, what is it? It's judgment of Torah, decree of Torah. In other words, sometimes the Torah is not bishlemuta in its wholeness, shlemut. It's, it's the... It's the law. Law is important, but there's a bigger Torah, and this Torah that we're describing with the word zot, without the vav, is the law. Come and see, zot, this is, with regards to the Levites, and we were talking a lot this week at a wonderful Shabbos, because we got to talk about how Korach was also a little bit right. He was a little bit wrong. He was a little bit right. Um, he wasn't right all the way, but there's certain kochot that the Zohar describes at great length. We learned about it last week in, in, in the Shir on Wednesday, and then we went even further, a little bit more Friday night and Shabbos day, about the koch of the Levian. So the Levian are from the, the tzad of din, from the side of judgment. That's what the Arizal says in the future, the Levian will be higher than the Khan, which is already the level that koch was already on, him and Beishamai. So um, 
This is what regards the Labim, Zot, not Vizot, without the Bav and this, since they derive from the Silent Judgment. Okay. Rabbi Huda said, but it is written Vizot, and this shall you do for them that they live. There is another verse that, that does say the Vav about the Levim, which is about the Levites. Yet you say Zot this and not Vizot in this. So which one is it? Is it only Zot? That's not, that's not true in that instant. He replied, certainly so, as is proven by the verse. If someone is holding deadly poison and does not blend it into an elixir of life, he will surely die. So, Vizot, and this you shall do for them, and they will live and not die. Since an elixir of life is blended with Zot, this they will live and not die. Surely, Vizot, and this is required, not Zot, this. So, basically, saying if you want to know the secret to be a successful lady, is you need a Cohen. Thank you, David Barrett. Thank you, Ted Cohen. Right? Without you, me and Zev would be in trouble. <laughs> We need to wash your hands. We need we need to blend the love of the Cohen with the with the strictness of the Levian. They they'd have no need to call us up for an Aliyah if, if the Cohen wasn't called first. Um yeah, that's true too. We get an Aliyah because of you guys. But we wouldn't be able to go up without you washing our hands. You, you know, we'd have the firstborn would take our place. <laughs> and and I asked if, if there's no firstborn, what happens? And somebody told Cohen me, in. the Cohen washes his own hands. Cohen. <laughs> Don't tell that to them. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> they, they should know just in case, just in case. Yeah. What do you do if a community only has Cohen in? They wash their own hands. Yeah. Okay. So, so the answer is you want to live. Yes, the lady is on the level of Zot, but if the if the lady wants to live, he needs to be combined with Kohanim and so on. Consequently, Vizot, and this is the Torah, really in single union, complete union, totally of male and female, the Vav and the He. Zot, this, the He. In other words, the Zot is the He, is the, the last day of the Yudke Vavke. Alone, so Zot, this is the statute of the Torah. Okay, go ahead. We have a bunch of notes there for you to read. Three, four, five, and six, <clears throat> seven. Uh, three on Vizot, and this general in particular is one. Tiferes, who is male, represents the general aspect of emanation or written Torah, whereas Shechina, who is fem uh, female, uh, represents the particulars or oral Torah. For another in interpretation, see Or Yakar and the Matak Mitvash. The word Zot, this alone, without the prefix va, signifies Shkina, who is identified specifically with the statute of the Torah, not with the Torah as a whole, since Shkina is associated with judgment. This reference to general in particular derives from rabbinic hermeneutical rules concerning a generalization and a specification. Next note, for Zot, this is what regards the Levites. Since the Levites derive from Din, judgment on the left side, the ver this verse employs a simple term, Zot, this, alluding to Shechina, who herself derives from Din, and not the compound Vizot, which would include Tiferes, who is identified with compassion. According to the passage in Numbers, the Levites are to serve from the age of 25 to age 50. Uh, next note, but it is written, Vizot, and this shall you do for them. If the term Zot, this, rather than Vizot, and this, applies to the Levites, then what about the another verse in Numbers where Vizot applies to them? The context in Numbers reads, Hashem spoke to Moshe and to Aaron, saying, Do not let the tribe of the clans of Kahas be cut off from the midst of the Levites. Vizot, and this you will do for them, that they live and not die when they draw near the Holy of Holies, or most sacred object. Aaron and his sons shall come and assign them each one to his workload. They shall not come to, in to see the sanctuary or sacred objects even for a moment and die. Um, six, certainly so is proven by the verse. Rabbi Yossi explains why this particular verse concerning the dangerous situation of the Levites requires the wording of Vizot and this. Since the Levites derive from the left side, they are vulnerable to harsh forces, which are potentially fatal. Shrina herself, who is simply called Zot, this also derives from the left, and this is sometimes known as the tree of death. Therefore, the verse reads Vizot, and this to include Tiferes, who is symbolized by the letter Vav, 
and represents this tree of life, an elixir or drug of life. Um, and he directs you to other places where you can find a note on Trina as the tree of death. And then finally, note seven, the Zot, and this is the Torah. As explained above, the compound word Vazot and this alludes to the union of Tiferes and Shrina, the former symbolized by the letter Vav, the latter by the feminine marker He. The word Zot, this itself alludes to Shrina as in the verse Zot. Uh, this is the statute of the Torah. See above note three. Okay, thank you, Zeb. We're going to continue now from... Um... Second paragraph on 189, Rabbi Shimon. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, is this the same Vizot HaTorah um, that you say, you say when you lift the Torah? Um, Vizot HaTorah. Yeah, 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 it's the same idea. It's the same, you know. It's, is, it, is it the same letters? It's the same letters, yeah. yeah. So isn't um, also... Is appropriate. Isn't, one of the things, yeah. isn't one of the things that we learned um, that also that um, on a Friday night, where a Shekhinah um, is represented by the Shabbos Eve, um, Shabbos Day is represented by Tiferet, right? right. And Shabbos right. moves from, from they're, they're two different aspects of God, right? Yeah. Um, the Shabbos, so, you know, the, this is this unific, the Vav and the, and the Zot uh, uh, is that unification, right? Yeah. So that's why it's very important because it represents this unification, which is the biggest theme of the Zohar. Maybe we should just launch into this, into this. That's a good segue because what David just brought up, uh, which is what we were involved in in terms of this, this, this idea of the of the relationship between the masculine and the feminine. Uh, why don't we launch into this? What what I consider. I don't think it's just me, um, the, the main theme of the Zohar, which is, drum roll, da 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 um, the, the, the main idea that the Zohar is promulgating and, and saying in so many different ways the same thing, and, and perhaps it's bringing out different new things about maybe there's maybe it's more than one theme but it it can all be easily summed up in a sentence or two which is the main theme here is that you have the masculine divine image which we call the holy one blessed be he and you have the feminine divine image which we call the shechina and the main objective of the Zohar is to talk about how we get them together, how we get the the yichud kuchurichu ushchinte, how we unite, we we bring into intimacy and union the Holy One, blessed be He, the Divine Masculine, and the Shechina, the Divine Presence. Another, so that that is, in my humble opinion, and again, like I said, I'm not like saying anything controversial, I don't think, maybe some people would disagree, but most people would say, yeah, that's either the number one theme or the co-theme or whatever their other favorite theme is of the Zohar. The question is, what, what would some alternate themes be? You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of not necessarily a great question of like, what's their alternate themes? I don't know. Like, it's not a book of the Shulchan Aruch. It's not preoccupied with the law, although it does mention different customs, but it's not, it's, it's not what it's really about. So, the question is really asked in a more narrow sense. Um, let's say you've got 10 spherot, you know, which, which is in fact the case, that the Zohar is preoccupied with. So the first thing is, of all the 10 spherot, what, why shouldn't the Zohar be equally or even more preoccupied with the higher three spherot? Which are um, Kasser, Chachma, and Bina. Kasser is. I'd say that in certain sections it is, only in those sections. Like in. Yeah, in yeah obviously, when it's talking Idra about. Idra Zuta and Idra, Idra Rabba, like, but. 
Correct. not the rest of it. Correct. In other words, obviously, it, it doesn't ignore them as if they don't exist. It just doesn't get the main treatment. It gets incidental. I mean, I don't want to call it incidental, but it, it, in, in terms of the vastness of the Zohar, the theme of the of Tiferet and Shechina comes up five, ten times on every daf. Mm -hmm. The Chachma and Bina comes up once, comes up ha, not at all. You understand? Or, or it comes up, but not like the just the sheer. But if you would enter a search again, the 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 the, the Zohar's words are coded, but the vast majority of commentators understand when it's talking about this unification or the opposite of the unification when there's a, a, a rupture between them is really, you know, there are so many more times than the other sphere. Now, the truth is that technically speaking, when I say, what I make it sound like that's the unification of two sphere. In reality, the sphere that represents the divine masculine, Tiferet, is a stand-in for all of the Zer Ampin, which is really six spheroids, Chesed, Gvorah, Tiferet, Netzachot, Yisod. So it's really six and one, which is seven. So in theory, you're talking about seven versus three, the first three versus seven. So you could just say, okay, they're more in, in, invested in seven's a big number. But I want to argue that even though Zer Ampin is all seven, they're not nearly as interested in the sevenness of it as they are with the masculine and the Shrina feminine. You understand what I'm saying? Like, of course it has seven, uh, six, I mean, six, six and one. The, um, Chesed and Gvura and Tiferet, for example, are essential to understanding what Tiferet is. Okay, that, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me put it another way. So that's the first question. And I could ask other questions, but let me, let me just, of, of what the Zohar could be about. The Zohar could be about the unification of the right and the left, which certainly it also is about that. Like last week, that's what we learned about. The Cohen and the Levy is the integration of the right and the left, which is integrated in, through Tiferet, right? That's what we learned about last week, remember? Look it up, it's on, it's, it's, yeah. you, know, you can access it. So for example, if you look in the Ari, it seems, at least, I didn't do a thorough analysis, but it seems, if my memory serves me correctly, the Ari is more interested in the harmony between right and left, or at least equally interested in the harmony between right and left, as it is between the harmony between Tiferet and the Shechina. Now, one simple answer is that I'm making a dichotomy that doesn't really exist. In other words, I'm like, you, you know, this is not a, a math book of numbers or whatever. Whatever has the greater number is the one that, that's more significant. It's, it's an integrated approach. So you could answer my question by saying the unification of Tiferet and Malchut only happens when there's also a unification within Tiferet of Chesed and Gvura and the other, and the other sphere within Zerah. And that, that would technically be true. But I think, it, 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 but that wouldn't tell the whole story. So those are two alternatives to what the main theme of the Zohar is would be a more of an emphasis on, on the higher Sefirot, on Keter influencing Chachma and Bina, the unification within Chachma and Bina, um, ha Chachma and Bina influence, the Yichud between Chabad or Keser Chachma and Bina, and everything else below it. Right? So for example, if you look at, at um, Lubavitcher Rebbe's emphasis. You know what it's on? Anybody want to guess? I'll give you a hint. It's two spherot he's interested in. Guess which ones they are. Chesed and Gevorah. Good. He loves Chesed and Gevorah, but I wouldn't say that that is his primary emphasis. Chokma, Chokma bin and Malchus. Kachma bin Adat, you know, David, you're making trouble because that's three. 
Well, that, it's a good one because that's the name of the organization, right? Organizationally, you'd have to be correct. <laughs> but what, what did Zeb say? Yesod and Malchus. Yesod and Malchus. You're half correct. So Tiferes and Malchus. <laughs> I won't say. Okay, anybody? You guys, next week we're going to do Chabad only. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, surprise, surprise. The Rebbe's two favorites are... Keter and Malchut, the two furthest away. Oh, that makes Those sense. Those are his two favorites. Yeah, but they aren't they the same thing? Because Mal Malkut is the Keter to the next level yeah. down. Absolutely, absolutely. Not, not, my not actually, not, exactly. The Lubavitcher Rebbe's whole point is messianic, and and his messianism, by the way, is probably. Um, it's about the ayin. It's about the not knowing. It's about it's about transforming our process through a, a shift in consciousness that's beyond even chachma, beyond bina. Can't you argue that that's like kind of Hasidus in general? The idea that like, okay, yeah, the spheros in the middle, it's all very interesting. But at the end of the day, we're talking about how the infinite is here and the most the the most infinite is here in the most particular. Is like kind of a Hasidic universal. Well, I would say it really became, it, it already had antecedents in other Chabad Rebbeim before him, but it really became very pronounced to the point where it's like, okay, how is he going to say this? What way is he going to say this this week? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, like, like, and he found, just like the Zohar found 500 ways to say what's essentially, I don't want to make it say the same thing. There's different components of it. And we'll talk about how, you know, any, any, any one theme has, as, uh, the ability for the people studying it to get a little bored of it, saying, I've heard this already before, you know. I want to argue for, for one more additional potential alternative theme of, like, next to, next to you know, Tiferes and Shrino or left side and right side, which is maybe another way of saying the same thing, but the reconciliation of the Sitra Achra. You, you would say that in the Zohar or just... In the Zohar, yeah, the like the reconciliation yeah, with yeah, the Sitra I mean, is like a I mean, I, I I would say that that's look. It's interesting because you have people that all they do is tell you about each rabbi what their sphere is, what they're like. What I'm doing now, the, the difference would be like I do this every week. That's all I would do. I'd say now we're going to do Rabbi Nachman, and now we're going to do the Baal Shem Tov. I'd go through like fifty rabbeim and try to like work at their spherotic emphasis and how they translate a sphere like a so so and the truth is is that they're all it's all already in the Zohar the Rebbe's stuff is in the Zohar the Arizal stuff is in the Zohar they saw what they saw just like you're seeing Zev and I'm I don't think I'm seeing what I'm seeing I think I'm just being a calculator you know what I mean like I see both but I see that numerically it just again and again the volume of, of this Tiferet and and and, and Malchut and Zohar is just overwhelming. Well, there is um, a good point about uh, if you're trying to get a message across. It's he used to say about good teaching. You say it three times, but if a Rebbe or whoever is repeating kind of almost the same message all the time, at a certain point it probably kicks in and people know that. Yeah, right? eventually. Yeah. But, but by the way, some people, because the, the Rebbe wouldn't say it in the same way, or, or, right. you know, just like the Zohar doesn't like to say it in the same The Zohar says the same thing in 500 different ways. I mean, literally 500 different ways, maybe more, maybe maybe a thousand different ways. Now, it's not, when I say the same thing, it's adding, I wouldn't say each time something, but it's often adding some additional elements. So, so here's what I want to suggest. I want to suggest a, a, few, a few reasons why I think the Zohar thinks this is so important. Um, and I don't want to make it about the Rebbe, which is in itself a great topic. Right? Why did the Rebbe focus on? on uh, we talked a little bit about it. We could do that another time. Um, so let's take a look. I wrote some notes on my phone. Now I just have to find it. Okay, here we go.
Okay, so here's a few things. So the first reason why I think Zohar likes the, this relationship between um, Tiferet and, and, and Shechina, masculine and feminine, is because it's the most dynamic. In other words, of course, there's dynamism in all the spirot in their relationship with one another. Chesed and Gvur, it's almost like I have a friend in California. You guys want to hear a million dollar? Anybody want to be a t television writer? Yeah. So I'll give you the million dollar um, insider scoop of how you do it. You pick two characters. This is really, I mean, the, uh, the guy who gave this to me, this is like, you know, he's like, if you want to write something, this is what you got to do. I shouldn't be saying it because I'm giving away a Hollywood secret. But it's basically, this is it. You build into the show two characters who are always fighting about something. Because they're just the opposite. And then you can always come back to those two characters because they're always going to be in conflict or maybe resolving their conflict and then getting back into another fight. So you're making the show interesting. You're making the show have drama in it. So, so any two things that are opposite are going to end up having conflict, having movement, having drama. So the truth is, you have chesed, you have gvura, you're going to have action. You know? You put the chesed person in a gvura person, they're going to be fighting nonstop. You, you, let's say you're, a, you're, you're an office, you're a team of two people, and one person is the nice person, and the other person is, is, is just like, everything is about the rule, everything is about some following some script, never veering out of it. You know that you're going to have a lot of activity. So, so why do I think there's more dynamism in the relationship, both good and bad, union and, and, and rupture between Tiferet and Shechina? Um, I'll tell you why. Because the most, there's a reason why people make like wife jokes or husband jokes. Do they make husband jokes? Is that a thing? They yeah. do what? They do. How come I've never seen that? It's, it's, it's a thing that's disappearing generationally. My generation doesn't make these jokes. About wives or husbands? Either one. Okay, that, that's because we're in a generation that, you know, you're not allowed to say certain things. But, or maybe we have, uh, no, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> so maybe we, we, have, we have good marriages. Sensitive, but, but there's a reason why there are all these wife and husband jokes. They used to be in the old generation. Because it's, challenging to make a house together. It's hard enough to run a business together or to have a harusa or to have a friend. You know, like, it's great. Like, a lot of times you have a friend because you never, ever ask them for anything. And, and by the way, it's a great, it's a great friendship to never have to ask anything. But once, you know, once you might ask them for something and then all of a sudden they're like, ah, I don't want to do it. And then you're like, I never asked you. I'm your friend your whole life for 30 years. I'm your friend. I'm your best friend. I, I asked you for one thing. You can't do it. And, you know, but a husband and wife, that's all they do. All day is doing things for each other. So it's really hard to be a husband and wife. I remember talking to somebody who was gay and went to a gay show. So I said, "What?" I said, "What's it like?" He said, "Ugh, my show. Everybody's married." <laughs> he was complaining bitterly. It's like it's not any fun. It's all about the family. It's all about the husbands and the husbands and the wives and the wives. 
is like, I don't enjoy it anymore. Every, like the whole, the new, like now that everybody's getting married, he was complaining that even, he, he, he doesn't have anywhere to go, so to speak. He wasn't the marrying type, you know? Um, but, but that's because when you get married, it's so much more than just one element of something that you might have with a friend or, or a business partner and so on. So, so that, that tells you why the dynamics of that, you, if a marriage is the best muscle, the best analogy of the unification of the, of the Holy One, but West be and the Shekhinah, that now makes sense of why that's the most dynamic. Of course, there's dynamism in a chavrusa. If you put the Rambam and the Ramban, or the Rambam and, and, and the Rivet in a base medrash, the sparks are going to fly. You know, they have different opinions. They're going to they're going to they're gonna be yelling at each other, and then they'll love each other once they once they you know finish the a, a good chavrusa. You fight like uh, you know like mad while you're learning. If you learn if you if you learn Gemara. And then once you're done, you feel great. You're like, you're bonded, right? But at the same time, you're done, you're done. You're finished. Whether it's an hour or three hours, the rest of the day, it's adios amigo, you know? So that's, that's to me, the really two reasons. The, the second explains the first. It's the most dynamic. Why is it the most dynamic? Because it's a relationship that that, that is unlike any other relationship in its totality of how we are. Okay. Uh, another thing, a third thing is it represents the purpose of creation, which by the way, that you could argue on and say, no, what represents the purpose of creation is not what the Zohar says is the, is the Yichud Kuchurich Shkinte, but it's the Yichud of the Kuchurich Shkinte that comes through the light of Arif or Atik or Kesser, same things that Lubavitcher Rebbe was saying. So then the question would be, why is the Zohar saying this is the Kachlis? Okay, it's a good question. And we'll get to an answer. The, the simple answer would be that the higher the level that we're talking about, they don't need any tikkun, they don't need fixing. And then you're talking about Keti, you're talking about Chachma and Bina. Even in the Shvira Takelum, it's more the realm of the Ari than the Tsar. The Tsar alludes to it in the, in the discussion about the kings that, that died. But, but um, the idea of, of something really needing a Tikkun, that starts in a little bit in Zerah and, and fully more in, in Malchut. But once you're, you're talking about the higher Sphira, there's no real Tikkun going on. So they... Like, like the, the, the ain't soap is the ain't soap. The cat there is the cat there. What, what do you need to really, how much you need to talk about it? If you fix the Zer Amp and, and, you, and unite it with the Malchut, so then the Rebbe's vision will be included in that. The Arich and the Atik and, you know, the, the, the higher, the, the Pnimi at the Kasser, the Chitsoni at the Kasser, the inner and outer levels of Keter, and the Chachma and the Bina, they'll all be included in that unification. Yeah, but, but on the isn't it true that on the Chokhmah and the Bina, um, that when the uh, Kalim smashed, um, the back of the Chokhmah and the Bina were also damaged? Correct, correct. They were, but as you yourself acknowledge, David, they're back. They're 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 the outer parts of it, not their their pneumute wasn't uh, affected really. So yeah, it's not perfect. It really, all of the Olamot will will be elevated so to speak uh, just, just um just one thing i'd like to say to the rest of the group i have absolutely no idea what i'm talking about okay so um when i mention this stuff i i, I really don't know what i'm talking about when it comes to no 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 for good i have good for good reason okay um um you know it's, it's just very very beyond me but it is true that there was some effect. I think. I think the way that Ari writes it is that it, it, the lower level we talk about death, and the higher level we talk, we use another term, which is a, a lot less strong or final than death. There was some some type of uh, 
breaking, but not a full breaking. You know, not a, not not nearly as as uh, violent, so to speak, metaphorical. So, so can I chime in here? Yes, because uh, th this has been kind of uh, I thought about this for a long time, and it doesn't make a, a heck of a lot of sense. If if God is um, let's call it all powerful, okay? yeah for lack of a better thing. And if the Sphirot are, let's say, you know, basically Kalim that are channeling his energy, how, okay, God can't be damaged, right? Um, so what is broken? And then also, how can God be separated? So, so depending on who you ask, the answer might be that the Zohar believes that you there's a there's a there's a walk around this question, which is basically to say. We we acknowledge that that there is this Ain Self, this this infinite divine one that's beyond change and, and everything. And and we don't doubt it and it's perfect and everything. But the, but we're now going to talk about the dynamic elements of light that God, so to speak, revealed with with their imperfections and perhaps their imperfections are ultimately going to come out to a better perfection and, and why would he want them and why would he allow them to, to disunite from each other and ultimately on some level from him even that's that's part of you know that's part of the mystery but the answer is is that we by 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 spinning off this this Sefirot, we can now talk about the dynamism and the and the divorce within the divine realm, and and, and that would be one answer. Uh, another answer would be to try to constantly answer your question, which is the endeavor of of let's say, um, this the the second Chabad Rebbe, everyone knows, those who know a little bit, was called the Mittler Rebbe. But the truth is, is that there was also a competitor who was not a son of the Rebbe, um, but he was a student, a top student called Aaron Halevi of Shrashala. He was guilty of being a Levi. <laughs> he wanted the top job. Uh, so he, was, he became a Rebbe and he had a lot of followers. And, and he's, his, 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 his purpose in life is to answer Rabbi Yossi, your question. <laughs> really, for real. Um, and it's based, he, he, he wrote extensively on Char Yichud Be'amuna, which is the second section of the second volume two of the Tanya of the Alter Rebbe, but he expanded on that theme, which is the gate of unity and faith. And actually, if you want a translation of that, I don't know if it's a translation or, or a condensation, uh, Louis Jacobs from London wrote, well, that was, his, that was his, his main scholarship. He was, he was a scholar in general, but his particular scholarship was in Hasidus in particular on, and the work of, of, of Aaron Alevi of Shoshala, hmm. the, the Rebbe of Shoshala. Tremendous work. You know what title? Bogus Halevi is the is the name of his work on the Parsha, and this other book, Shai Yichud Emun, is other safer. Tremendous. Right, right. But the uh, uh, as far as Louis Jacobs' work on him, do you have a title for that? Uh, the Gate of Unity and Faith. He wrote a separate book, Louis Jacobs. He, right? he wrote just that book on 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 the Shrashella. <clears throat> the Shrashella. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well worth the read. Yeah, you'll enjoy it. By the way, a lot of people who are not big uh, into the Maserati movement uh, as a movement, they love Louis Jacobs for his, they just love his stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah, he, I do. Successful, 
a lot of the contemporary writers see do it. You can't read that. You they, they can't write a sentence. They're very convoluted and and yeah. I don't know who they're talking to. I mean, you know, not all of them, but he's he's old school. He has something to say, but he says it in English. You know, and he and he and he isn't so highfalutin that he he, he want to explain to you what what's actually written. He wants to make sure you understand what's written. Yeah, he's good in that regard. He's just pretty well regarded. Thank you. But thank God I'm not an Orthodox rabbi in England. Otherwise, they'd probably stone me for saying that. <laughs> I know, but you know, you know something that um, towards the end of his life, he was um, he was voted um, the single most influential Jew of the last two hundred years, really? and um, by the community in general. And it was just it was just it was just a funny little thing you know and and the impact that he had he made on it on on things and how he got treated by by the um united synagogue and the chief rabbinate was was really horrible uh, because you know he wrote that article which everybody everybody has this has the same allow allowing allowing you know the the i have reason to believe mm -hmm. and um you know it, it, is that they, they only made a big deal of it about 10 or 12 years after he wrote it. And, uh, and you know, it's just, it was the whole thing was just all political. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I wasn't part of that, David. So I, don't, I mean, I, I'll, I'll look it up, I'll Google it. I just know- Rabbi, in 1964, you weren't part of it. Yeah, anything. I wasn't even born. But, but the point <laughs> is, is that growing up, you know, when you have limited access to, to other Hasidus, I mean, I always had access to Hasidus in, in the original, but it's it, it's hard to break into like a new type of Hasidus without having like either a teacher or a translator. Chabad, I had teachers, I had plenty of, you know, I was able to break in from a pretty relatively early age, say by 14, 15, I could open up almost any Chabad Sefer with, with the exclusion of a handful of the, the more complicated ones and figure it out. But let's say Reb Nachman, which actually surprisingly I was able to figure out at that age already. But there would be other works and you, you're you always looking for English. Should we go? To help you out. So you, you know, Louis Jacobs is one of those guys who did this bang it out job of like making uh, Kabbalistic and Hasidic texts accessible, explaining them, giving a little background to them. You know, he, so he, you know, he he thought beyond his local, you know, people that he had to work with. He was a scholar, and he was a little bit of a mystic. I don't know what he wrote, and I have reason to believe. Obviously, no, uh, I have reason to believe was that he cast doubt on whether all of Revelation happened at Sinai, and or whether it really happened over an eight hundred year period following Sinai. So, um, but in so terms of his like mystical side. It's no big deal in, in JTS or, you know, um, definitely in reform. But I guess in England, it's just like, it's, they're, they're more traditional. I, they're, they're, God bless them. God bless the, them. Or the, the, the Gateshead crowd, are, there's um, the, Hare, the Haredim side. But um, the, the, the one thing he did, he did this great book with, actually, um, the person who wrote the foreword, a woman called Karen Armstrong, who's a fallen oh, nun, sure, sure. Uh, and um, and he wrote this great book called Jewish Mystical Testimonies. Yes, um, where where he talks mm -hmm. about and he goes through it all. And the fascinating one to me is Rabbi Caro, oh, yeah, um, on, on on the night of Shavuos, and yeah. uh, you meet you meet the Magid. It's a great book. That was one of the books I read as a teenager. Had a big impression on me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. The Jewish yeah. mystical testimonies. Yeah. It's called yeah. Jewish mystical testimonies. Yeah. Yeah. I for me it was like I was just in my uh, bare, uh, middle twenties and I read Principles of the Jewish Faith, and here was a, you know, I think uh, from where I was coming from, where anything that was not rational was was basically they poured bleach or acid on it yeah, uh, yeah you know and he he was fair and balanced yeah. you know yeah. i mean it was amazing i just loved it mm -hmm. yeah he was he was kind of like uh, i mean he's not the same style but 
he was like kind of the equivalent of of uh, of um, what's his name? Uh, he was at JTS, the very mystical um, Heschel. Heschel, yeah, different. Again, a little less poetic and a slightly more scholarly. Although they were both scholars, they're both poetic. If I had to, you know, say which one was a little more of which, but. Um, yeah, so it's an interesting thing that you had, you know, you, you know, you have that sometimes, just like here in the U.S. We have uh, from Zalman's uh, uh, yard site. You know, Zalman was a mystic. He was uh, he was an Orthodox. He started out as one, but it, you know, he didn't end up as one. But he was still, till the end of his days, wanted nothing more than to inspire people to to experience the ruchnius of, of Torah. Yeah. And he always showed up uh, uh, in. It, you know, a lot of these public things, even to the end of his life, he dressed as a Hasid. Yeah, I, and I'll, I'll personally say, like, it, 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 it is vital to have somebody who's sort of, like, on the outside like that. I don't know who else, like, I'm, I'm a from Yid because of people who are, I, I was thinking earlier today about how, you know, I grew up totally, uh, I mean, very Jewish, but still totally secular. The moment that I realized that I believed in God. I didn't actually like decide, okay, now I'm going to believe in God. I had a moment where it's like, oh, I, I actually have been believing this for a while now. I was reading Martin Buber. Like that's when it clicked for me. So yeah. you have to have like some people who are not really in it to like get the people who are outside to come closer sometimes. Yeah. 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 That's very important. Yeah. So, um, Let's go further. I don't remember what number we're up to, but we I think it was number three or four. No, number three was the purpose of creation. Number four is that the Zohar, again, it's a circular reasoning, thinks that the Torah is primarily about the unification of the Holy One, Blessed Be He, and, and the Shekhinah. So, for example, all of exile and all of redemption, whether it's exile of Abraham going to Egypt or, or Jacob going to Haran or Joseph going, being sold into Egypt or the tribes leaving, going down to Egypt or the Egyptian enslavement or the subsequent freedom from, from, from Egypt and the entering into the land of Israel, all of those things fit in to the idea of the unification of the Holy One, blessed be He, and the Shekhinah, or the the divorce between the Holy One, blessed be He, and the Shekhinah, or the, the hiddenness between the two of them. And so, so most of the Torah can be explained um, through this concept. Okay. Um, another thing. Is I I, I don't I, I I'm trying to remember the safer that brings this down. There's a safer that basically says this is uh it's it's a very Reb Zalman thing, but it's not Reb Zalman alone. It started to be before him, and and what it is 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 that there's a safer that says look, there's a lot of levels that God is on, you know. There's the transcendent. There's the imminent. There's the masculine. There's the feminine. There's the and so on and so forth, right? So the question isn't just what is there about, you know, God and, and the sphere out of God. The question is which part or element of God is a nation more connected to than the other parts of God? You hear what I'm saying? Like perhaps one nation is very into God's kindness. They're a nation of God, of love. And another one is a nation of law. What are we? So there's, there's a commentator that says we are the nation of Zeranpin. That's our relationship with God. Words, when, we say how, when we say God's name, what are we talking about? We're talking about Zeranpin. 
Obviously, it's a little bit more complex than that, but that's this argument. So that would mean, and, and now, and where do we know that from? The Zohar. How does the Zohar know it? That's that's their problem, how they know that. Okay, so that's another answer. Um, a, a, yet a further answer might be is the calendar. Uh, both the weekly calendar, even the daily calendar. The, the Zohar we just got through talking about uh, there it's more chesed and gvura in terms of the day and night. But let's say the six days of the week and Shabbos are in a relationship with each other. And then Shabbos itself is, as David mentioned earlier, it starts out as Malchut, and then it moves Shabbat morning into Zer Ampen, and then even later into Keter. So it's the unification, even with, uh, uh, what, what is Kabbalah Shabbat about? L'chadodi the Karkala B'nei Shabbat Nekabla. What is it about? It's about the unification of the Holy One, blessed be he, and the Shechina. The, the B'nei Yisastar connects that also to the leap year, that like the solar year is masculine and the lunar year is feminine. So when we add a leap year, we're unifying the, the feminine year and the masculine year in that sense. Oh, beautiful. So, I mean, each one of these themes has a lot. We could go, go further. Space, obviously, we have the idea of the of the Beta Mikdash, which is the when God is present, we say that God only enters the, the Beta Mikdash below when he's when it, it's parallel by the Beta Mikdash above. And like we say, when it talks about the Mishkan, God dwells with us within our impurity, or it says, don't impurify the Mishkan because you're, the, the Shechina is there, which is interesting. It's a paradox. On the one hand, it says, don't, don't because, on the other hand, it says, he's still going to be with us in our impurity. And that theme of, of having Eretz Yisrael, Yerushalayim, the Beit HaMikdash, the Kod HaShem, the Mizbech, and the things that happen there, are all revolving around the the unification of the masculine and feminine, the deferent and 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 malchut of God. Okay. What else? The. element of, of the Zohar that deals with the darkness of the Shechina, the potential dark side of Malchut. That Malchut can become sinister, can become even evil. So by recognizing that the, that, that the main idea here is to redeem Malchut and Shechina is to also deal with the problem of evil in the world. Not with some like kind of shift of saying it's not really there, it's an illusion, not at all. To the contrary, the Zohar is very well aware of evil and how it has its source in a, in a spiritual place, yet it also has a focus on trying to do the tikkun on that. So, if it were just talking about it's similar to the earlier answer that's saying the higher sphere don't need a tikkun. But here it's a little more than that. It's saying, this is a dark world we live in. We really need the, the, the unification of the Holy One, best be in the Shechina. Okay. Any comments on that? One more. And I only have well, this. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I can understand why, <clears throat> excuse me, why Gvura can be seen that way, but how can Malchut be seen as that? Well, actually, G Malchut embodies Gvura. Gvura in and of itself is the source of something that will manifest in a dark way or an evil way when it descends into Malchut, and Malchut isn't in the state of unity with Tiferet and Yisod. Oh, okay. Yeah. But you're right. There are sisters or brothers, whatever you want to call them, uh, Gvura and, and, and Shechina. Mm -hmm. So the other one is 
is that Tiferet really is the, it, it, it's, it's an, even though we don't talk all the time again and again, this are about, about the unity about the right and the left. It does talk about it quite a bit, but it, it usually just talks about the unity between Tiferet and, and uh, Mahut. But it's a given that for Tiferet to unify with Mahut, it needs to be already inclusive of Chesed and Gvura in a harmonious way. So it's, it's like saying, we need to unite our right and our left so that we can make a unification between ourselves and someone else, you know, like it, it, it's not, it's, it doesn't see the unification between right and left as another concept. It's, it's, inclus, it's included in Tiferet. Every time we say Tiferet, what we really mean is an existing harmony between Chesed and Gvura. Tiferet can't unite when it's, when it's in disarray. Tiferet is the state of harmony. The word Tiferet means harmony, which includes right and left. And last but not least is um, it could be that that um, the whole purpose of the czar is to counteract the, the Torah of just being in the head. The poetry in it, the, the power in it, stories in it, and the, the heart, which is what Tiferet is, is, it's the heart of Judaism. It's not the head of Judaism, perhaps. Other people would argue, a lot of times people don't like when you say something isn't the head. They think it's an insult. I don't, I don't think it's an insult, you know. Like sometimes somebody comes to me and says, Rabbi, I don't respect you for your, you know, your, your being a scholar. I respect you for being a person with a heart. I don't consider it a, unless they say I'm an idiot. Okay, which might be true, but like if they're if they're saying I respect you for your for your heart, I'm fine with that. I don't I don't think it's necessarily it may not be right, <laughs> but but I don't think it's an insult to, to, to say the czar is a book that's full of heart, full of, of, of love, and therefore it just it resonates with the concept of the ferret, which is heart and love. And it's not it's not love, it's compassion, but it's close enough. It's the heart of compassion. So that's a little bit about why I think that that the this is the key theme. That's the, the the keystone to all of the czar. Why why? And that, those are my answers for tonight. And the bottom line is that is also a practical thing. That that when we do a mitzvah, we have that in mind. We we have in mind. To unite the Holy One, blessed be He, and the Shekhinah, whether it's the um, the idea of including yourself in the whole and kind of merging into a bigger picture, whether it's whether it's making the land of Israel a place where the divine presence rests there that transcends things, whether it's um, allowing your your heart and what it ordinarily desires kind of dissolve and make way for what can be a heart full of love of God and awe of God and, and that to lead directly into what you do. You know, that, that's part of this. So thank you guys.